All right, Ayla, thank you very much for the adult beverage for the speaker. Thank you. You should always beer your speakers. If you don't like them later on, then you can go ahead and extract something out of later. Anyway, I'm G. Mark. Thank you for being here. I'm going to talk to you today about how the West was pwned. Now, of course, we all know what pwned here means, right? It's not like I'm speaking to a bunch of corporate folks who have no clue. Because I put up a slide like this, because every now and then people are like, well, it's a typo. No, it isn't. Of course, we know it's like being completely dominated. But I did my undergraduate work at Northwestern University. And I was there when they started our 38-game losing streak. Worst record in Division I still to the history of any football team. And I came back after graduation for our homecoming. And we got pwned by Ohio State, 63 to nothing. But the good news was the point spread was 10 touchdowns. So we actually won that. Uh, so you won your bets. But it's like your boss's machine, the pointy-haired boss that you get from Dilbert, totally owned. The problem is, therefore, how do we go ahead and protect against that? This thing doesn't angle high enough for tall people. There we go. And we want to take a look at how we, as a Western civilization, are having all of our systems pwned by, well, somebody else. So if we look at the evolution of cybersecurity, for those of us who were around for old days, like Win and me and things like that, remember what? The old mainframe days, where you brought in a whole deck of cards, and you walked out with a fan fold piece of green and white paper. And the access control was where you're wearing a white lab coat with four color pens. If so, you got into the computer room. If not, you got out. And then from there, what happened is we got what? PCs, at which point they said, oh, no, the perimeter's gone. But then it got worse. Then we got luggables. Oh, no, the perimeter's really gone. And then we networked them together. The perimeter's still really gone. And then we had handhelds, and we got everything else, and so we see as the evolution of security, we get a new challenge every time. We start out in the Stone Age, we work our way up to the Bronze Age, we get down to the point where we're in the Pone Age, we're going to be taking these things in a particular orifice that is not really designed for uh, insertion of non-USB devices. So what do we do? We're going to take a look at some of the threats, so the scope of those, and the consequences of failure to detect. Now, when I'm going to be talking on a particular country here, not to mention any names, uh, <coughs> People's Republic of China, but it's not that I'm picking on them. These guys are good. In fact, they're very, very good. They represent kind of the significant standard of excellence of what's out there for attackers and how they're able to go ahead and do long-term penetration testing and long-term penetration, long-term extraction and things like that. And we want to understand here, and kind of my goal of this talk is to give you a little bit more of a kind of a geopolitical view of what's going on out there and some of the risks that we're facing. So it's not so much that you're a target. Okay, yeah, we know everybody's out there. If you're on the internet, you could be a target, but it turns out that you're the target. And you're the target because you're here in North America. If you don't work for a dot mill or a, a government contractor or the government itself, you've got something, you've got intellectual property, you've got manufacturing know-how. There's something in your network systems. It could be PII, it could be credit card data. People are going to be able to use that and make some money off of it, and you want to be careful about not letting that happen. And therefore, what we have to ensure that we don't allow ourselves to get you know, relaxed by saying, well, we're not all that important, nobody cares. Now, some organizations are going to be able to take a hit because of the stuff they do. Hey, I'm a defense contractor. I use highly sensitive information. People want to come after me. But sometimes it's what you don't do. It's because you don't protect yourself that you make yourself vulnerable. It's because you have exploitable systems that are easy to pick up on a big wide scan that someone says, hey, let's go take another look. Wow, we got in, let's go for more. And even if you don't have anything of interest, what else could you be? You could be a reflector attack, right? We'll hack your boxes and then you're, use your boxes to go ahead and attack somebody else. So if you are a target of choice, it's a whole different game. Because if you find out that if somebody's just looking for the weaker system, it's like the story of the, the hunters who went out in the woods, right? And after a day hunting around by the campfire, kicking around, and there's some rustling in the bushes. You know, what is that? I don't know. I think it's a bear. So one guy starts putting his boots on. He's like, dude, what are you doing? You can't outrun a bear. Of course, you know, the thing, point is, I don't have to outrun the bear. just have to outrun you. So if you are a harder target than the next, chances are you're going to survive. What happens, though, is that if you are a deliberate target because somebody has picked you out, either a disgruntled employee or you've got something that an opponent definitely wants, they're not going to be satisfied with somebody else. They're going to keep at it, keep at it, keep at it until they get into your systems. Now, if you look at the number of malware variants that are out there, they've got over 100,000 Android variants have already been determined and cataloged, over 128 million malware variants, mostly for the PC world. This is a huge amount of stuff that's out there. And when you go ahead and go shopping for apps, how do you know that this stuff is any good? 
Do you crowdsource it? Do you wait till it gets to the one million downloads and you figure, well, one million people can't be stupid, all right, and then therefore it's safe to go ahead and download? The problem with any of this stuff, though, is we don't know. And as a result, we're seeing new variants of malware, stuff that goes ahead and buys apps on your behalf because it's got all your credentials. And because we cross-link all our credentials into our little handheld devices, we run the risk of having a lot more taken than just that. Anybody running a ransomware yet? Anybody here writing ransomware? You know, it basically says, you know, your hard drive is now encrypted, and if you want the answer, if you want your stuff back, you have to go ahead and go down to Kmart or Walmart and then get one of these cards and key in the information. Okay, that's targeted for Joe Sixpack, the guy who does not understand how to go ahead and decrypt their hard drive or go ahead and break the back of the malware. And the price tag is usually low enough, 50 bucks, $100, that eh, I guess you're going to go do it. It's just sort of bad luck. It happens, and then people go on. That stuff works. The browsers, as you're probably aware, are becoming the bigger target than the operating systems. Microsoft, for better or worse, is getting a whole lot better at putting out better code. Windows 8, a lot more secure than Windows XP ever was or will be. And by the way, what happens to Windows XP in April of next year? Well, they stop support. And do you think Microsoft's going to tie a nice little bow around and say, hey, here's Service Pack 4? Every last little patch in there in a nice, neat bundle. Now, that would be a fun project to work on. Okay, be, someone would want their, that. But so what? Who cares? Okay, so nobody's writing updates for Windows XP, but then nobody's writing malware for XP, right? Wrong. Well, how do they know what to write? I mean, they've had 11, 12, 13 years to go look for vulnerabilities. How do you know that? Well, how would you know what to look for? Is there any shared code base between XP and, I don't know, Vista 7 or 8? Oh, yeah. And what happens when a patch comes out for 8? You reverse engineer the patch, you say, oh, it's in that DLL or it's that module. Whoa, the same thing's in Windows XP. Now you got a permanent zero day that's going to go ahead and take that system down. So for those of us who kind of like the old XP world, because i got this ancient laptop, but it's still crunching along, the danger is, is that after April you're entering zero day zone where there will be a permanent set of vulnerabilities that are never going to get patched. And the more time you spend in that environment, the more likely you are to have your systems taken over. Also, we're seeing things such as nation states and cyber armies that are coming on board, and, and we're not using that term euphemistically, because this isn't our biggest threat. Anybody, you know, who's this, of course? Anonymous, right? Anybody here in Anonymous? You, you'd be surprised. Seriously, I was like at an office depot last year, and uh, buying a case of paper, and a guy's carrying it out to the car, and he says, well, what do you do? I work for National Security Corporation. Well, what's that? I do cybersecurity. Oh, dude, I was an anonymous. It's like, oh, you tell strangers you do felonies? Tell me more. And he said, yeah, I was kind of bored one weekend, so I just kind of joined. We hacked at Dot Mill for a while, but I couldn't get in, so then I went on and decided to go play Halo instead. All righty, so that's sort of like if you're bored, let's go ahead and try to break things. If it doesn't work, go on to something else. Well, this isn't a professional hacker. This isn't a guy with skills. He's just somebody who's bored who just becomes sort of an army of drones. And the danger there is, is that some of these people do damage, but some of them also damage themselves because they get caught because they're not very sophisticated, and they got a lot of explaining to do, and now all of a sudden their careers are messed up. How about these folks? Who's this? Come on, pattern recognition? It's not a Rorschach blot. Who is this? Peanut. Mr. Peanut on bad drugs. No, it's Lulzsec. All right, seriously, we don't have any pet. I mean, even business people know this stuff. This is, this is terrible. Okay, it's these folks. Recognize them. People's Liberation Army. Okay, that's the uh, People's Republic of China. They're doing an extraordinarily good job of fielding professionals to do cyber work. I've seen estimates that put the total count of their cyber folks around 180,000 people. That's about the peacetime size of the United States Marine Corps. That is a whole lot of cyber analysts all working to go ahead and steal your stuff. Now, when you get those guys plus organized crime in there, we find out that there's a lot of forces out there that cause for those of us who work on the defense, who have to protect our companies, who have to protect our clients, that the attack vectors are coming from all over the place. So we see stuff like this on the internet. You know, did China hack the Pentagon and things like that? And, you know, who, me? Did I do that? But what, what's China's response to this? Yeah, it's always what? Deny, deny, deny. It's like politics. Always deny it. And so Mandian came out with this report. You probably saw this. Coincidentally came out, what, just in time for RSA? Can we say this is a big marketing coup for them? But if you read this thing, anybody read the Mandian report, APT1? Yeah. One, two, a couple. You should take a look at it. First of all, it reads like an intelligence report. And 
It almost begs the question, how come this isn't being released by the CIA? Why is a report that has photographs of buildings, it has pictures of people, biographies of people, it reads like something from that, but it's coming out from somebody other than the United States of America. And I think it's because we as a country, we as a political organization, didn't want to go ahead and poke China in the eye. Because we've got this sort of this dysfunctional codependency going on. Like, we buy their stuff, although we complain about the trade imbalance, and they buy our bonds. They complain about it because they don't want to see the U.S. economy tank, because then all their money's going to tank. They can't dump the bonds or go to war with us because if we cancel their debt or cancel our debt to them, it's a huge trillion dollar event. And so the net result is we sort of stay connected somehow when we go lurching forward trying to come up with stuff, but there's still going to be disagreements. Chinese response to that. Well, none of this is tolerated. I mean, cybersecurity problems could be what? Like a nuclear bomb. Yeah, absolutely. But the difference between cyber weapons and nuclear weapons is what? When you drop a nuke, what's left of the weapon? Nothing. A lot of radiation, green glowing glass, you know, but that, not much else. What happens when you drop a cyber weapon? Well, you can capture it intact, you can disassemble it, turn it around and fire it back. Just like in a cartoon where you catch a grenade, you throw it back and then you throw it back and you throw it back. And these things get a long, long life of their own as they go through multiple generational cycles. Because your malware doesn't blow itself up at the end, it might blow the target up, but more often than not you can capture a piece of it. So you look at some of these attacks and you see these fingerprints on it and you go, who did that? I don't know. They're not arguing to say that they got it, they'll say we didn't, but I'm gonna suggest that uh, that looks like somebody we know, right? But of course, the official response is like our friend Bart. I didn't do it, nobody saw me, you can't prove anything. And so thus comes the problem with attribution. If you can't prove who did it, you can argue about it all you want, but all you're gonna do is just have an argument back and forth, you have nothing convincing. Now we look at the advanced persistent threat, or we've heard about APT. And I was at, uh, up in Manhattan yesterday at the SC Congress, and they had a whole bunch of vendors out there. And there's, there's one girl working there who's, who's uh, you know, we defend against APT. And I says, well, what is APT? And it's basically a marketing term today. Oh, well, we defend against APT as if it's some sort of venereal disease. Well, no, not really. What it is is it's a cyber adversary. They got all these great capabilities. But the problem is, is that well-funded, well-resourced, long-term attack sequence, which means they're willing to go low and slow. And if you only have a seven-day retention for your logs, they'll go ahead and they'll send packets at you every eighth day. You'll never, ever correlate it because you, your data retention, your correlation engine is such that they'll work around that. And the idea is they're not just going to go after governments. They're not going to go after contractors. They can go after anybody because they want intellectual property that's worth something. Tremendous success. The second dot point is what really got me concerned. The average access that they were able to do was almost a year, 51 weeks on average. Well, what happens if you are owned for 51 weeks? How much information can be hauled away from your systems? It's kind of frightening. And so when I talked to people in the corporate world, and I got an audience full of executives, they said, if that's the case, statistically, one of you is owned right now and you don't even know it. You've got something in your network, it could have been there for a year, in some cases four years, 10 months, and people just don't know how to act about it. Now the hall is huge, you're looking at a petabyte of data. Hey, remember your powers of uh, thing, you know, three zeros is a kilobyte, and then six is a megabyte, and nine is a gigabyte, and then 12 would be a terabyte, and then 15 is, of course, your petabyte, and what comes after that? Exabyte, and then? Not yet. Zettabyte, then yottabyte, then lots of bytes. And I don't know if they've come up with that yet. I was going to propose like winabyte and maybe it'll stick. And you can just get a name and you never know. It's like Google, like 10 to the 10 to, 10 to the 100th. If you come up with a name early, it might stick. But that's one of the few numbers that's actually bigger than U.S. national debt, which is ticking along a whole lot faster than this as we speak. I think it's up around 17.3 because we've raised the debt limit. They don't even bother to try to hide the fact that they're coming after us. Come on, all these English language people going after us with computers that are registered in China. So seriously, you're gonna tell me that you're not doing this stuff? Yeah. Well, we have more specific details. People's Liberation Army Unit 61398. General Staff Department, about a thousand English speaking folks. They're in a particular location. You can look them up in Shanghai. 
photographs of the building are in the report. It's essentially a very well orchestrated operation that's doing a massive amount of cyber espionage against the United States and against their allies, and they're doing it very, very well. They do recon, they do defense, and of course offense. Offensive warfare, that sounds like fun in the cyber world, right? You get to break into stuff. Well, here's the question. Today, you know, when some of us old timers started doing the hacking, could you go ahead and do that legally? Actually, you could. There were no laws against it back in the 70s, early 80s. There was nothing. There's no Computer Protection Act. There's no Computer Fraud Act. There wasn't any of these other regulations. And so as a result, it was whatever you did was fine. And the other thing was is that you could do it, but the ethics were different. You broke into systems just because you could, and you'd close the door behind you. Because the idea wasn't to cause damage, it was to go ahead and see, could you, could you prove it? It was an intellectual challenge. It's like picking the neighbor's front door lock. And you got the door unlocked, and it scared you, but you got the door open, you quick locked it and closed it. You'd never think of going in there and breaking it. Today, everything's all about how much can you steal? How much can you monetize? And so hacking a web page just for greets to your buds doesn't happen much anymore. It's hacking a web page to create a watering hole to inject malware onto somebody so you can go ahead and get a pivot into their network break into their systems and exfiltrate the really good stuff. Like, oh, I don't know, the RSA root seeds, for example. So they can do some really cool stuff that way, which is dangerous. Now, I want to know, where do you register your APT to get a serial number? Is this like getting a low number license plate? Because they're numbered now. This is like APT 12. They're the folks who did the New York Times. APT 1, well, they're the folks who are going after the DOD stuff. So like, whatever happened to APT 6? I am not a number. I am a free APT. Well. Pretty certain it's also these PLA folks. And they're doing it well. And they went quiet after a while, and they came back another time, new malware, new evasion techniques, new way to go ahead and prevent detection. So the point is, is we're up against opponents who have a pretty good grab bag of tools. They're very patient. They're going to be working for a long, long time to go ahead and get what they want. And it's not just a small amount of information either. If you take a look at some of the estimates, OK, this is from Defense News, so defense.gov. A more than the Library of Congress every 12 months. Now, think about it. That's a heck of a lot of stuff, but it's also going to be a lot of useless stuff. Firewall logs or all the imagery of scanning a particular corridor and all the video of nothing happening down there except the cockroach every now and then. I mean, that's data, and it gets stolen, but we don't care. It's the good stuff that gets stolen that we care about, and that's what we want to go ahead and start protecting. Because otherwise, we get what? <laughs> we get pwned. And someone said, yeah, great. This has got to be one of the most um, odd animal things. I was trying to get Ashley to help out with this. I said, can you animate this a little bit? I don't know, maybe do some twerking. But she said that that was beyond her skill set to do. She didn't have time to twerk the giraffe. So if anybody's good at uh, graphics, maybe we can make that animated. But that's kind of what's happening to us, right? We're taking it. <laughs> so FBI, same deal with organized crime. A lot of danger out there. And we think, well, yeah, well, so what? Who cares? But most of us like paychecks. It's kind of nice to eat once in a while. And so as a result, the organization is providing us with a paycheck. It's taken down. And we're out of a job. There's a good cycle time to get your job back again. It's not like the good old days where you get a job next week. Now, maybe you can. Most people take a little while. And if that organization goes down, it gets worse. Your government goes down, game over. Well, actually not. Government was down for a while, and we sort of survived that, didn't we? You know, maybe we just need a break every now and then. Even the United Nations, for all of their great power, recognize that this is a huge thing. Now, it brings up an interesting question about the UN. What's the form of government we have in the US? A republic, a constitutional republic. Someone argues a dysfunctional constitutional republic, but we've got a constitutional republic. What's the form of government in China, PRC? I don't know. Communism, yeah, something, whatever it is. But it's something different. But there is a government in China. We'll admit that, right? And they govern, and they do pretty well for whatever they're doing. OK, so we're all part of the world. What's the world government called? Who's in charge of the world? Well, world Bank, whatever. But reality is, come on, who's up there? It's not UN. Nobody's in charge. Well, nobody's in charge, it's like, South Sudan, what do you call that kind of government? Anarchy, exactly. And if there's nobody in charge, you got no one to run to. You can't go, mommy, mommy, they're picking on me. So you're on your own. 
And so what we find, therefore, is that in an anarchical system, that complaints and resolutions are not always done in a peaceful manner. Of course, the first thing you want to do is you try economic sanctions. If that doesn't work, you do diplomatic sanctions, and that doesn't work, what? Then you pick up the phone and call the Pentagon. Okay, go put some warheads on foreheads. Enough of this stuff, and off you go. But the thing is, is that we got to go ahead and take action ourselves. We can't really depend on third parties to do that. And if you look at some of the tool sets that are out there, you can go ahead and, and get some pretty good service level guarantees with the malware that's out there. Look at all the feature sets in here. Wow. I go, one x86 binary written in Pascal. Anybody still write in Pascal? I mean, I did that 20 years ago. I guess it still be used. Anti-reverse engineering techniques, custom API loader, blah, 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 blah. All this stuff is out there, and it works pretty well. The spam, we're getting more and more of it. It's working because doing something called a snowshoe. What's a, what is, for those who go out in the winter, what do snowshoes do? They distribute your weight. So a snowshoe attack does what? I get an attack from a different URL, a different address every single time. I'll never see the same one twice. So I can't blacklist it anymore. It breaks blacklists. It's starting to happen with your cell phone if you haven't noticed it. You get more and more calls, and you answer, congratulations, you have one. Hang up, and then you blacklist that, and you put it under spam. And the next time, another number comes up, congratulations. I'm at the point where I've whitelisted my cell phone. If you're not in my directory, you go to voicemail. And if you're real, I'll call you back. And if not, chances are the computer hangs up. But that's happening with our systems, too, is we're getting these connection requests coming from all over the place. And now you can buy some malware and build your own botnet. You can go ahead and get service-level guarantees from the Russian Business Network. You want to go ahead and steal credit cards? We'll give you a piece of software that will do that. In fact, we'll guarantee you still at least 100 credit cards, or we're going to give you something special. But by the way, we don't take credit cards for payment. No surprise there. And if we look where the industries are going, it's no longer going to be the banks, okay? Willie Sutton, the old famous bank robber, when they asked him, why do you rob banks, what was his comment? Hey, that's where the money is. Well, today the internet is where the money is and your server is where the money is. But manufacturing has gone up to the number one spot. Why do you think manufacturing and all of those other industries is number one? Well, who's stealing? China, how many people in China? About 1.3 billion. How would you like to try to keep full employment for 1.3 billion people? Particularly when you don't have an industrial base and all the universities and all the research centers that we have had for generations. You've got to get the information somehow. Thank goodness for anarchy, because if we steal it, what can they do about it? You can't drag a Chinese citizen operating in China on a Chinese piece of equipment and say you're breaking a U.S. law. So what? Who cares? It doesn't apply. There's no extradition treaties. Isn't that what our friend Ed Snowden figured out? Hey, let me go someplace where they're not going to extradite me. And so the net result that comes out of this is, is that we can learn a little bit about our opponent by what they're targeting. And what they're targeting is the manufacturing know-how that we've already lost an awful lot in the United States. Why? Because it's cheaper over there. We'll just have it made in China. Hey, the new SkyDog electronic badges are made where? Shenzhen, China, because it's cheap. It's not always reliable, we had a little bit of problem getting them here, but it's cheap. And we tend to be managing our economy based upon quarterly reports. But how long does China think ahead? When they leased Hong Kong to the British in 1898, how long was the lease? 99 years, okay, so you failed the final hacker jeopardy, sorry, 90, 99 years. So what was the deal? We get this really plum piece of real estate. Have at it, 99 years. And of course, everybody's saying, oh, jolly good show, you know, someone, oh, grand, grandchildren will deal with it, but let's have at it. So after 99 years, man, look at all the property improvements that were made, and we just hand it right back. And China's going like, that was easy. <laughs> let's try that one again. So Hong Kong has special rules. How long is the Special Administrative Region, or SAR, for Hong Kong in existence for? For five years? Six years? Try 50 years. They got a 50-year SAR. We don't think in 50-year time frames. They do. In 48 of the last 50 centuries, what country had the largest economy? And we find it was China. It was even bigger than the Egyptians and the Greeks and the Romans and anybody else a long time. And what caused the Chinese economy to shut down and stop trading with the world? Come on, anybody take history? 
Yeah, the opium wars in the 1840s when the British were buying tea and teak wood and all this other cool stuff from China, and they're, of course, paid with gold. And then after a while, they're saying, like, um, well, all of the gold's sitting over there. We ought to get some gold back here because gold's important. And so they said, well, what do you want to buy from us? And they said, well, nothing. No, no, seriously. You've got to buy something from, nope, nothing at all. Well, we've got to get that gold back. So what they said is, how about we start selling them drugs? And so it turned out that Great Britain ended up being the biggest drug dealer in the world at the time, essentially addicting all the people in the eastern part of China to opium. And finally, the emperor had to say, enough of this, close the borders. And they stayed closed for, I don't know, about 130 years until some guy by the name of Richard Milhouse Nixon came along in 1971 and said, hey, let's open up diplomatic relations with this People's Republic of China, this, this Mao guy. And we can use that as a strategic counterweight against the Soviet Union, because Soviet Union has a habit of, well, I don't know, the domino effect, communism going into different countries. And so maybe that's going to go ahead and allow us to do better. Well, the Chinese did what? OK. Yeah. That was a nice 130-year nap. Well, well, look, parades moved on. We're not in the lead anymore. Time to get back to where we belong. So in China's mind, they are the number one economy in the world. They always have been. It's this temporary aberration because you've got this little country called, what, the United States? Oh, how inconvenient. You're 226 years old, and we're 5,000 years old. Go away, kid, you bother us. But, oh, by the way, you kind of like to buy our stuff, so we'll keep selling you stuff to the kids, <laughs> Americans. See how it goes. So what's happening now is that if you look at that global economic situation, China's got some real issues, though, don't they? If you've ever been over there, anybody been actually to China? Interesting place. What did you find out? What was what year? How how long ago was that? And uh, last, month, two months. last summer, what part? Beijing or Xiong? How's the uh, weather down there? How's the how's the pollution and things like that when you get to the big? Sons of Haiti yelled out because they're burning coal. And you get to the cities, you can't see anything. When they had the Olympics back in August of 2008, they had to shut down all the manufacturing for days and days so they could let the air at least blow out so the Olympic athletes would die. And even if you look at the broadcasts that are coming from the U.S. embassies, they're talking about air quality control. It's like 755 on the 0 to 100 scale. I mean, it's off the scale. So they've got huge ecological problems. Social issues. Okay. One-child policy, remember that under Mao? Because we have too many people, so let's make fewer of them. So if you're a parent and you can have a child, which do you want? A boy. So it's like Bor no, not Borat, what was the most recent one? Yeah, the, um, the dictator. You know, oh, you're pregnant, how nice. Are you having a boy or an abortion? You know, and, and that was kind of what happened. And so now you get this huge imbalance, about 115 to 100, I believe, male to female ratio down in the high testosterone years, you know, 20s and early 30s. And how do you typically get rid of all that extra testosterone if you're running a government? War, war yeah, exactly. Well, war's kind of messy and sort of expensive, and it's not really nice. And so why not find some way to put them all to work? And if they get a good factory job somewhere, well, then maybe they'll be reasonably happy. But how do I get the factories going unless they have something to make? Okay, well, the Americans are making stuff over here, but that's still not enough. We've got a lot more people. So let's use their designs and we'll make our stuff ourselves. Because if you spend years and years in research and development, you finally figure something out and you file a patent on it, you get basically limited monopoly rights. For 20 years in the U.S., you can make it all yourself. Well, what happens if you spend years and years doing research and development and you have to pay that all back? You have to price that into the cost of your product. So you recapture your R&D plus the variable cost of manufacturing, and then over the long haul, you should make some good money. But what if somebody else could do the equivalent of copying all the answers off your paper and turning it into the teacher first and getting the A? And then you turn yours in, they say, hey, you copied. What? One of their favorite targets, too, is uh, the periodical systems at universities. Uh-huh. They love to steal credentials, log in as the people, and then mass down all the research. Mass down all the research from the periodicals and universities. Um, didn't that happen up in New England last year to rather tragic results? It had nothing to do with China, though. It, yeah, it happens all the time. And the idea being is that it's a legitimate approach because culturally it's a different set of values. It's okay if it's not tied down. If you've ever been over in the, the uh, Pacific, I used to work out in Hawaii. And, and in Hawaii, the idea of personal property is rather fluid. Okay, so if I left my cell phone here and I walk away and someone else comes along, hey, bro. 
Thanks. It's fine. I'm not stealing. I'm not doing violence. You left it there. It's mine. It's kind of what you do when you leave stuff lying around. It's kind of community property. And so you help yourself and off you go. It's a different society. So I, you know, I got stuff. The only place I've ever had stuff lifted out of my suitcase was going back from Hawaii to the mainland. You open up and like, something wrong. Okay, well, wrote a letter to the United Airlines. Hey, got a really nice set of um, sunglasses stolen, Maui gems. And United Airlines did what? They wrote me a check for the value of the sunglasses because they said, the guy's not BSing us, it's probably real. People get their stuff stolen all the time. Plus, as a 1K, they probably wanted my business. The bottom line is, though, is that different cultures respond different ways, and we're not on a level playing field. Now, if you look at company size, also you're seeing that the attacks are going after the sm SMBs, small, medium businesses. 100, 1 to 100, 250 employees. Why do you think we're seeing such a huge increase there? Bad security, because they can't afford lots of people. You're lucky to have one person dedicated to security. Chances are it's a collateral duty, like chief cook and bottle washer, and oh yeah, I'm a security expert. Yes, sir? They're, they're, an ex they're a profit center, we're an expense. They're a profit center, we're an expense. And when it comes time to budget time next year, you sit down all around all the pointy-haired bosses, and they said, well, last year, you asked for half a million dollars for computer security, and we gave it to you, and nothing happened. So why should we give you more money this year? Because uh, nothing happened. The hard part is being able to prove the causation of investing in security and nothing happened. Bigger companies get it. They got chief risk officers, they got compliance officers, they got to live in a world where there's more sophisticated decision making. But for those of us in the organizations that don't have that mature, sophisticated level of decision making, you go, eh, you, you do the best you can. And sometimes you take a hit. And the hits cost, on average, about 1300 bucks. Now, this is Larry Poneman's data. Larry runs the eponymously named Poneman Institute, and he typically, I, I knew somebody would get that and I was hoping it was you. Uh, but Larry Poneman is a pretty good deal of collecting statistics and getting paid to regurgitate them. It works, good, good work if you can get it. And what he points out is that for these SMBs, on average it costs about $1,300 per seat. That is not per event, but per employee. Now, but you, but I'd rather get a $1,300 bonus at the end of the year than I would to see $1,300 stripped off the bottom line and going off to some fraud. Plus, Think about what the profit margins are in your business. Grocery business, they say roughly around 2% profit margin. Might be a little bit more. It's not 20, it's not 50. Maybe two, maybe three. Well, how much top line do I have to make to bring in $1,300 at the bottom line if I'm in the 2% margin? That's 65,000 bucks. $65,000 in sales translates into about $1,300 in profits. And so now $65,000 times the number of employees, and you can see why you get costs in the millions, because these come out after you've tried to make a profit and they pick your pocket. If someone's gonna steal your money, it'd be better to steal your money before it was taxed and expensed. Kind of like the old cartoon about the two guys, you know, the guy comes along and says, I'm gonna go rob you, give me your money. And he goes, wait, hey, wait a minute, when I stole you 20 bucks, here's the 20 bucks, so you're gonna pay it back first. And then the guy robs you, because now you've been paid off. It's sort of the same idea. We wanna go ahead and settle those debts before we have to deal with these things that get sucked away. Now, websites are being used against us and to kind of a bad purpose. About a quarter of websites out there, according to uh, Semantics Research, says they have unpatched vulnerabilities. Okay, so what, who cares? But now take a look at the unpatched critical vulnerabilities and things like that. Legitimate websites, over half of them, have got exploitable vulnerabilities. And when you get malware, 61% of them come from places that are legit. Doesn't mean that you have to worry about going to some evil website. Rather, what happens is the poor security on legitimate websites results in them being infected, whether it's a SQL injection or somebody goes ahead and puts some malware up there. But you come along, you're going to your county database. That's what I got. Only time I ever got malware in my system was the Pinellas County Property Tax Appraiser's Office, their homepage got owned, and when you say, oh, you have to download this SVG viewer to look at your property records, and then boom, things went bad. And oh, by the way, it was really good malware, and was not detected by Semantic or McAfee or by Microsoft or anything else. I had to figure it out myself and yank it out by the roots. I eventually ended up using some software I got from Russia. Didn't feel so good about that, but it worked. So that hard drive is now re retired. It's sitting in my drawer waiting to be uh, you know, nuked back to all zeros, a pristine start, and then I can trust it again. But no hurry, so it's not worth the time to fix it. All that from a legitimate website serving up malware. 
And if I look at some of the malware that's out there, again, hacking is a service. It's a new paradigm. If you want the suite for governmental interception, is passive monitoring enough? Deploy a secret agent, go stealth, untraceable, defeat, and hit your target. This is the actual PDF file, and got to figure that when you're advertising malware in a PDF file, open this thing in a virtual machine, please, um, <laughs> which I hope I did, but so far no ill results in trying to create this slide. But looking at their stuff, it's like, yeah, kind of scary what's out there. So what's the score? How are we doing? Well, kind of like for our Hacker Jeopardy, it looks like the... Uh, Chinese are doing the Ken Jennings things to us, and uh, we are getting pwned. So all this information is getting taken away. They're earning it. They're going to run with it. They can market the stuff in the global marketplace. We're stupid enough to not say we won't buy it. And in fact, we're finding that counterfeit goods are getting injected into our supply system, up to and including U.S. military. So for my buddies who fly jets, I said, how does it feel to go Mach 1.5 on the low bidder? <laughs> it gets worse. How does it feel to go back 1.5 and a little bitter with counterfeit goods in there? They're going to fail because they're not made to the same tolerances as, as the mil spec. And now we have some real problems there when we start to inject that stuff into our supply chain throughout industry. So how are businesses organized to defend against this threat? Well, let's take a look. Typically, we have what? We've got an IT department, and you've got employees and contractors, the manpower, you've got vendors and suppliers, and who do you take your direction from? Ultimately, headquarters. Well, the danger here is that we find out this model can get co-opted. And so instead of the regular healthy employees and contractors, we get the Chinese espionage agents. Those people either get hired in, sometimes they just become our own people who go, go bad on us. They also get some counterfeit goods gets into the system. So who ends up owning us after all? PRC owns us. And this is what I call a pwn boy sandwich. We're on the menu. We're going out to lunch with Hannibal Lecter. That's not a good thing. And so we say, well, OK, fine. That's PRC. I'm not too worried about the Chinese. Well, OK, let's look at the same equation when it comes to organized crime or hackers and crime and not the, you know, the, the evil guys, not us. You know, we're, we're the good hackers. But the same sort of organizational structure. But now you get crackers or the like. You get malware getting injected into systems. And now crime syndicates take over. And again, we're on the menu again. We're, what's, we're the special. Buy two, get one free. And as a result, we have to face the issue of we're in a very, very attractive target because we're able to yield this information without too much resistance. Now, if your boss downloads a, a virus, what happens? <laughs> Click on surrender. Game over. They're not going to know what to do. They don't want to know what to do, and they don't have time to figure out what to do. they got to go ahead and move on. So when they get a certificate mismatch, they plow ahead. When they go ahead and they get a PDF that sums up, they just plow ahead. When you say, hey, click on a link in an email, they click on a link. Why? Because they're in a hurry. They don't stop to think about the consequences of it. And as a result, the social engineering, the phishing, works extraordinarily well with executives because, well, they're speaking a different language. And pff, you end up being pwned. I love that picture. I want to see what happens when this little kid gets a little bit older and realizes what happened. So what's the statistics? What, what's the score here? Well, good news is we got a national intelligence estimate. It comes out every year. And ours came out in February this year. So I downloaded a copy, and I took a look at it. And it turns out it's redacted. Sorry, it's classified. You can't see it. Well, it may be. Ed will let us see it, but right now I can't see it because I don't have the clearance for it. And so that's no good. And of course, the president has some statements that talk about foreign countries and companies stealing our secrets. That's in the State of the Union address. I mean, that's kind of high up there in terms of letting everybody know. And look at Tom Donilon, the national security advisor. He's talking about serious concerns about these sophisticated, targeted thefts about information. They're really making a mess of things. But the problem is no actions being taken. We're not dropping bombs on anybody. We're not doing demarches. We're not doing economic warfare. Oh, we threaten it for a while, but then we go back to doing business. Why? Because we want to make money. And so because in this anarchy system, there's no serious consequences to doing the espionage, it's going to continue, and it's going to keep happening. And of course, <laughs> what about our buddy here? Let's take a look at some of these things. He's got his own website now. The Guardian is now kind of cranking things out. I think this guy might have made a tactical error. Remember, what, what, was, what was the announcement about Snowden a few days ago? Oh, I don't have any more classified information. I don't have any of it with me in Russia. You think the Russians are really happy to have this guy there? As long as there might have been a possibility that he had something useful, there is a reason to let him live. Um, I 
think that he might have misplayed his hand. Well, he might have made a lot of errors, but the point is, is that now the Guardian is publishing these things and saying, hey, how much disruption can we create to the world order? These are the digital golden apples being rolled down the aisle to try to see how we can go ahead and create discord among nations. Ooh, Ooh. Well, you don't like discordia, the no, Greek I, reference? I don't like what you're saying. Okay, good, I'm glad you woke up. What don't you like about what I'm saying? Finally, I, all right, talk. Let me ask you a question. What do we now know that we didn't know before June 10th? We know that the vetting process for subcontractors is not a very good one. <laughs> it's not so much that we know it, but give me three more slides, and then let's answer that question, because I, I, I want to readdress that same question, which I was hoping to prompt, so thank you for bringing it up. But I'm going to recast it in a different face, because now we're seeing... Everybody's furious about the U.S. spying. We've hacked into the U.N. We've hacked into Merkel's cell phone, yada, yada, yada. Everybody's complaining. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my soul. The Americans are horrible. But I'm thinking, you guys ought to be doing it to us, too. And if you're not, you should be fired for incompetence for not taking care of your country. Because if you take a look at why nations go to war, and I'm actually I'm reading a book by that very title. So the author's conclusion, after looking at 150 years of warfare, going back, is the number one reason that nations go to war is a misunderstanding or a misappreciation of what the opponent's capabilities and intentions are. Because we don't know what you're up to, we're going to go ahead and go to war just in case. We think you might have weapons of mass destruction, so we're going to go ahead and invade your country. Or roll all the way back to other things, World War II, World War I, Things that start wars are because somebody doesn't have the good insight. If you knew what the other guy was up, if you knew that the guy walking into the bar trying to go ahead and be a rough guy, yeah, he was wearing a gun, but it's unloaded, you, you reassess the threat differently because you know what that person has, and so that intelligence helps you make better decisions. Two weeks ago, Canada, front page up there in the Globe and Mail. Brazil rift, and now the Brazilians are all upset. And so they ask the Canadians, are you allowed to do this? Problem in Canada is what? No oversight for their signals directorate, and that the same like we have in the U.S. So, uh, well, we, we sponsor people for clearances, eh? Um, but we cannot do not target Canadians under Canadian law, eh? And that may be true, but that wasn't the answer they're looking for. So, President of Brasilia, I don't know who she is. I would not want that woman angry at me. I don't know what you know, but just that one photograph says, no, don't, don't get her mad at you. And now she's really going to head and put the screws to Canada. And why? Because that was in one of the U.S. reports. Well, here the other thing is coming out is all these revelations that are coming out. Oh, it's from Snowden. It must be true. What if the next release was manufactured by one of the editors at the Guardian? All he has to do is put a whole bunch of these terms on here, make it look like a PowerPoint. We must believe it. it has to be true. Hmm. Be a little bit skeptical. But come on. Everybody does it. Everybody's reading your mail. Everybody's going ahead and doing espionage. Everybody's trying to break into stuff. So, well, come on, big boy. Why not you too? So we look at the French. We look at the MI6. We look at the Israelis. We look at Germany. We're all doing it. It's, it's been going back for centuries. In fact, now here's to your point about what did we learn. This is nothing new. Was ist das hier? Das ist ein Enigma, ja? Und wo ist das? Wer ist das? Yeah. And so... Come on. Anybody else but Wynn recognize this? Yeah. And so what we do is we say, yeah, bad, well, bad haircut. What if we decided that, you know what, we should have a public debate because it looks like the United States is actually breaking into somebody else's diplomatic and military communications. And we think America needs to know because can you believe it that they might actually be intercepting communications that are going to people who could be Americans? How would this world be a little bit different if the German Wehrmacht ended up winning and all the efforts of the waves and folks working and decrypting that were not the case? So, oh, well, that was different. We're at war. Well, we just looked at a whole bunch of stuff that suggested that at least we're in an economic war. And the reason we're in an economic war, not in a kinetic war, is this. Back when Rome used to go ahead and invade and take over with their armies, they go up to a city or, or a city-state and they'd say, what? You got a choice. You can pay us a tribute or we kill all your males, we rape all your women, and we enslave your children, and then we salt your fields. You got one night to think about it. What do you think you do? Uh, tribute sounds pretty good. Well, 
What's happening now is intellectual property is becoming a proxy for tribute today. If the Chinese can extract the intellectual property, basically keep us alive, why kill the host organism? And so now, although we're facing the equivalent amount of economic cost of fighting a war, it's become sanitary. It's like the Star Trek thing where you go into the disintegration chambers, which is kind of reminds me of the new TSA scanners, right? But, you know, you go in there and say, oh, sorry, according to the computer, your city's been uh, targeted, so 500 people have to report for disintegration. Right now, we're at the point where I think we've learned that a, we're doing the best we can to accumulate stuff. Some of us might look at it and say, hey, I'm a taxpayer, and at least I know I'm getting my money's worth. All that money going to NSA, hey, they're, they're doing something with it. They're not just going and throwing parties in Las Vegas. So that could be a good thing. Now, back to your point, Wynn. We know more about stuff than we did before. Is it a good debate at this point in time, considering where the U.S. is diplomatically and the current administration and some of the moves that they've been doing recently with places like Syria and Iran, and very you know, sensitive diplomatic stuff going on. Want to do that over a beer at the bar? That way, or want to talk about it now? Do it now. Have at it. What's your thought? I mean, people forget Echelon existed. We, we, this was an open secret published by Nikki Hager in the 1980s. Here is how Echelon has worked. Combination of the UK, Australia, Canada, United States, and South Africa doing a global eavesdropping system on everything, including undersea cables and satellite communication. This was an open, everybody knew it. So what's different here? We knew about e May West, May East. We knew about the conglomeration and the how the cables all go together before we hit some of the new uh, satellite stuff. What's different? It's the same stuff. The only difference is, were you really surprised when you read some of these stuff? Did you go, Oh my goodness, I never thought anybody could do that, let alone us. Then why isn't the media educating America to the point that this is nothing frickin' new? That's the problem with the American media. They make their money by getting points. Hey, did you see the stuff yesterday with the guy sitting on the Acela train tweeting away? I thought this was great. And I, I, I was watching its, um, what was it? Tom Matz, he, he's sitting there on the Acela train going up from Washington, D.C., up north, and he hears this guy behind him on the other side talking about um, black ops and this, that, the other thing, and he kind of looks over the top, and he's like, Jeez, holy shit. It's former director of the National Security Agency. And so he's doing this off-the-record telephone interviews with reporters. Well, don't quote me directly, but just say an unnamed federal official and on and on. And so Tom's tweeting away as fast as he can everything he overhears. And then he see one of these tweets and says, uh oh, they might be on to me. Somebody tell my wife that, you know, where I am in case they come get me. And they, his phone's ringing. Okay, good, he's on another interview again, I'm safe. And he tweets, tweets, tweets and says, I wonder if I could pose for a picture with the guy. And sure enough, Kai reads over the, <laughs> he says, hey, you wanna take a picture with me? Because what had happened is, General Hayden's staff called him up and said, um, excuse me, sir, uh, there's a guy in the seat next to you and he's tweeting everything that you're saying, <laughs> confidentially, off the record to a reporter, and he sort of recognized you. So, boom, cover blown, pwned. So he came around and says, here I am sitting in my laptop. That's the last known picture of the man on the left alive. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we, we realized it's like, seriously, OPSEC failure at that level? But maybe it wasn't all that important. But it comes back down to the discussion that we're talking about is that as a, as a people, the Americans, do we really, do I really need to know everything that goes into the sausage? Because at some point in time, some people should be read into programs. That's the reason why we have classification. Some people should not. Some people have the sophistication to process good information. Other people are alarmist. And so, Going forward, we say, was the intent and purpose of these programs to make billions of dollars for a kleptocracy like we see in, I don't know, the post-Soviet Union where the Soviet officials say, hmm, I'll tell you what, we have to privatize now because we're no longer communist. Okay, you want the oil industry? You can have it for a dollar. I'll buy the uh, uranium industry. I'll pay you a dollar or a ruble. Okay, book. We, we paid off the government. It's done, and now we're both billionaires. That's the type of thing you look at and go, not cool. But if the general purpose is to say, what's the number one mission for a nation? It's to protect the safety of its citizens. 
If the purpose was to protect the safety of Americans, and we say, wait a minute, you went too far in trying to protect our safety? Okay, well, that's a different discussion entirely. But now what's going to happen is that everybody's out there is going to change their crypto. Everybody else is going to change their mechanism. Everybody's going to start encrypting everything. And it's going to be a lot harder. We're going to have to spend a lot more money to try to get back what we had. And trust me, we're going to be trying to spend the money to get back there. Because the idea is if we know what somebody else is up to, we're much less likely to have a misunderstanding and a lack of misunderstanding. Historically speaking, you have fewer wars, you have fewer deaths in combat, you have fewer things like that, which in my opinion is a good thing. I was a, for those who know me, I spent a career in the military. And as a military officer, you're really, you're the last person who wants to go to war because you're the guys that get shot and blown up and killed and come home in, in pieces. Rather, war are, is, is an extension of politics, and I'll mention that in a couple more slides. But here's a question that I think Wynn's bringing up. What's the relationship between intelligence services and businesses? I mentioned, hey, is we doing this for private industry? I was talking to some French folks over in Europe a couple weeks ago, and the Frenchman does not believe that our CIA does not provide secrets to Microsoft and provide secrets to, to Boeing and everything else like that. Well, that's the purpose of an intelligence service in France is to go ahead and enhance the world competitiveness of your economic base. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't know if anybody wants to do a deal with the devil so to speak, and say, I will allow my company to exchange data with the CIA in exchange for what, please? And so if that were if any, any of Snowden's revelations, I think that would have been a bigger bombshell than, oh, well, we're trying to listen to somebody else's email or we're trying to listen to somebody else's communications. I mean, everybody has a signals directorate, and that's everybody's mission. It's your own responsibility to protect your stuff, and if you didn't do a good job, shame on you. And if you didn't do a job trying to go ahead and intercept somebody else's double shame on you, it's just the way that the game is played. It's nothing new. And again, NSA isn't going to try to steal your credit cards. They're not going to go ahead and do identity theft. They've got better things to do. We're not comfortable with the loss of privacy, but Scott McNeely said 14 years ago, get over it. You have zero privacy anyway. And we cede our privacy for convenience. We want a single credential on our smartphone that goes ahead and lets us do everything. We want to have one shop, one click shopping. And in doing so, we make it that much easier for someone to go ahead and take away our privacy. The previous session, as you were listening there to Skydog, talking about how you can use open source intelligence, fuzz your data, start, you know, don't create the public record. Hey, you drive an automobile and you go through a toll booth, there's a photograph of your license, but you don't want that taken, ride the bus. Oh, there's a camera on the bus, well, then go ahead and walk. Well, there's street corner things, then walk at night. Well, there's infrared out there, okay, then douse yourself with ice before. You know, at some point in time, put on that tinfoil hat and go live in the woods. But the reality is, is that there's a lot of surveillance out there. We look at things like the bombers that took place up in Boston, and they rolled the clock backwards to say, hey, who was where and how do we figure out? And we connected the dots, and we nailed those guys pretty quickly. And then someone says, well, you can't collect all my phone records for all these years, that's evil. Well... You don't know what you're looking for. It's big data. But you know that you go back and you can't audit it a year later and say, hey, we think this might have been an issue. I understand that we might say, well, wait a minute. If you're collecting my data, aren't you violating my Fourth Amendment rights? Is the data any more detailed than what your phone company is collecting to provide your service? It depends on whether you use it. It's like, are guns bad or is it the guy pulling the trigger that's bad? Okay, good. I finally got some hands up. I'm getting people excited back here. Yes, sir. One, two, three, and then win if there's something. The difference between the government and a phone company is this thing called the Constitution. Okay, so companies are exempt from the Constitution. Good to know. Let's form a company extra constitutionally. It's an invented right. No, it's not. This is where everybody is fucking wrong. Good. All right, thank you, Professor Schwartow. What document was signed in December of 1948? Historians? What? You're supposed to answer if your hand is up, dude. The Magna Carta. Drink. And how's that working for us? I'm just saying you can't say there's no rights when it was signed. 
Oh, okay. So if we signed a document, then it must be true. There's never been a contract broken in the history of the world? Yeah. All right. Touche. All right, fair enough. Okay, one more question, then I've got to get the last couple of slides, and then we'll come back to you after my next couple of slides. Yes, sir. It, it becomes a concern about the sovereignty of your nation. And some of those discussions come up to say, do you want to make the United States subordinate to an international body like the United Nations or something like that, rather than say, as a sovereign nation, we have a right to go ahead and make rules within our country, which is some of the concerns that we're talking about. And do we want to make things that this has now come up on Second Amendment rights with some of the international conventions we're talking about. And people who care about their Second Amendment rights say, hey, these international agreements contravene what we have as a US Constitution. So a couple quick slides so I finish on time and then we'll do some discussion. Corporations do stuff. They, take, they lay you off. You take my house. You corrupt democracy. You deny your claim. And so guess what? We hate the government. Um, well, are we misdirecting our anger here? The better debate, I think, is, is your national security really protect the interests of our citizens? If we're preventing economic espionage, that's good. If we're identifying early potential threats, that's potentially good. But the thing is, is that we're trying to play poker at the chess table. We're dealing with this diplomatic world where now all of a sudden we've knocked over a whole bunch of pieces and everybody's complaining about it. And I'm not sure that open debate really helps us. So what do we conclude? You know, we look at General Clausewitz, who wrote Vom Kriege, which is kind of the treatise on war uh, from the Prussian army. And he says that war is a continuation of politics by other means, which means all wars are political. Generals don't start wars, politicians start wars. And my corollary to that is espionage is the continuation of business by other means because it's gonna happen, and it's just a natural progression of how we do things. So we've gotta protect ourselves. We can't rely on the government to do it. They care about us, but just so far. Your partners and your suppliers care, but just so far. Mom cares. In fact, call mom, it's a weekend coming up. You ought to be calling mom if you got one. But only to a point that mom can do something about you. You've gotta protect yourself. You've gotta take the leadership role. Find these guys that are in your system, grab them, knock them out, kick them out, keep them out, or again, we're gonna end up being pwned, and we're gonna go ahead and take it when we don't expect it, at least expect it. So, those are my thoughts on how the West was pwned. Let's use the rest of the time for Q&A, because I think we've got some, finally some debate going, and then somebody go ahead and pull the hook when it's time to move. Yes, sir. Uh, no, I'm not, allowed, I, I failed law, I didn't take any law classes. All right, Smith was but all right, watch his dog. If you want to learn about Smith versus Maryland, 1976, come to his dog. Okay. Yes, sir. But if they told you it wouldn't work anymore, that's the problem. It does if you're good and you're the guys who are smarter than everybody else. Security through obscurity is a fallacy if you're not an expert because smarter people will figure it out. But security through obscurity can work if you are the experts. That assumes that you're who, here, who here did not already know all your shit was being listened to anyway? Yeah, was anybody really surprised? I mean, was you were surprised. You didn't know that anybody had ever around to read your email. No, I'm assuming that I'm at least one incremental step better than they are. And that has been the assumption on the crypto that the agency develops where you look at certain classes of crypto and you say, hey, these things are algorithms that we're not going to publish, but we're going to use them for classified information. So Kirchhoff's principle, which says, go ahead and publish the algorithm, just protect the key, works for certain things. And suite B, that'll work. But there's other suites that that doesn't work for. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm, I'm, that I'm really unhappy with. I'm less concerned about the ops that they're running 
than I am about the fact that some internal trusted insider violated that. And I see I'm down to the last seven seconds on the clock, so we're going to have to adjourn this over to the bar so the next speaker can talk on time. Anyway, thank you very much. Have a great afternoon. Welcome to it. <laughs> Greetings. <laughs>